Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You have no... Thank you. Yeah, don't whistle, you'll interview at the microphone. Thank you very much. You have no idea what divine privilege it is to be playing back in the bosom of my own native people. Two lovely, big, freckled, welcoming bosoms. <laughs> That's what I see in front of me, not strangers' faces. Delighted to be here, delighted, you know, and um, you might not know this, but um, we're very popular people. The Irish, did you know that? Everybody loves us. Everybody wants to be fucking Irish. <laughs> Everywhere you go, oh, I'd love to be Irish. And I go, why? They go, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> people expect you to be drunk. He'll travel the world building things, sleeping in cement mixes. It's a great life. <laughs> Most of us are fiercely proud of being Irish, aren't we? Fiercely proud. That's it, that's it. Fiercely proud of something that we don't understand. I'm Irish, whoa -ho! What does it mean? Ah! It means I'm not fucking English, that's what it means. <laughs> You know, most people compare themselves to the English, you know, because they're going to come out of it looking good. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I, you know, I like the English, you know, and I like England as well, you know. Obviously, I like to see them defeated in, <laughs> in, in stuff like football and war. Uh, <laughs> but in general, I think they're good people, you know. They have a fierce reputation, you know, the English. England has a fierce reputation for conquering the world, you know, invading loads of different countries and then getting upset when those people followed them home. <laughs> okay, don't clap at everything, we'll be fucking here all night. <laughs> now... <laughs> I, you know, and... I think Irish people, I think we're just as interested in taking over the world. Uh, we don't do it by invading, though. Uh, we do it by infesting. <laughs> It's a different plan of attack. You see, we copped on. <laughs> that you kind of scare people. You get their backs up if you arrive with hatchets and machine guns in a foreign language. No. <laughs> the Irish way. Two people arrive. <laughs> Armed with just a sleeping bag <laughs> and a phone number. You go up to the tallest person in the village. Hello there, don't mind us. We're Irish, we're great crack. Ah, so we're always laughing in Ireland. Ah, mad as badgers. Jeez, I was on the lock last night. I came back home and put the rashers in the toaster. Ah, don't mind us. If you're Irish, come into the parlour. Good luck to you now. Nothing to fear here. And the two Irish people disappear into a cottage. Three weeks later, 47 Irish people walk out. We're very relaxed as well. We're much more relaxed than the English, you know. They get very uptight about rules and regulations. You have to do this the way, you have to do that. So we're not like that at all. You know, often to, to our detriment. I was in a pub in London recently and a fire alarm went off and I just couldn't believe what happened. I, I, everybody left. I was like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? No, you wouldn't get that over here at all. You could be in a pub in Galway, right? A pub made out of Christmas trees <laughs> and petrol. <laughs> in between a fireworks factory <laughs> and a remand centre for young criminals. <laughs> at Halloween. <laughs> and if a fire alarm went off, sure, you'd look for the fire. <laughs> If you didn't see it, it didn't fucking exist. <laughs> if the fire alarm kept going, you'd start making jokes about it. Ha 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 ha! Is that my phone? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we, it's a wildly different country we have now, so we're all loaded. This Celtic tiger bullshit golden calf economy that we have. There's no more poor people. Priests carry around photographs of poor people from the 1980s. Just, just to scare children. <laughs> Telling them stories about such wild and 
dangerous things as butter vouchers. <laughs> Rent allowance. Oh, Daddy, no, stop, Daddy, stop, please, Daddy, stop. <laughs> I left school in 1987. We had the highest unemployment in Western Europe. And we were secretly delighted. <laughs> you couldn't find a job if you looked for one. <laughs> it was socially acceptable to do nothing. Especially in this town, everybody was doing nothing, you know? But nowadays, people have 14 jobs and 29 mobile phones and no fucking personality. And it's just, <laughs> things have changed, you know? People get this, it's not, you can't be unemployed anymore. People think there's something wrong with you. Everybody has to be doing something. At least when you're doing something, people know what you're up to. <laughs> That's why when you meet somebody, so what do you do yourself? You have to ask them, you have to know if they say, Irish are a bit of, what the fuck do you do? <laughs> People who do nothing, they could be up to anything, you see? It's, just, it's not fair, you have to tell us. They try to bring it, and this, we, we, everybody's obsessed now with getting from A to B as fast as they can. I drove down to Galway the other day. <laughs> from Dublin, my, I fucking floored it. <laughs> 11 seconds, it took me 11 seconds. <laughs> I fucking floored it, Fintan, I really floored it. <laughs> Fuck off. And it's just, that's not good for the head and stuff like that, and, and you know... They tried, they tried to bring in a law on Grafton Street, right? Against loitering. <laughs> so, you know, and if, it doesn't sound so bad when you say it like that, when you think about it, that's a law against doing nothing. <laughs> you cannot loiter. Now, for a long time, Dubliners thought it was something to do with cigarettes. <laughs> You can't loiter. <laughs> Who am I supposed to fucking smoke us all? You big culty guard. <laughs> but yeah, and you do, you cause panic and pandemonium when you do nothing. And I thoroughly recommend this. The best place to cause the most amount of panic by doing nothing is in a bank. <laughs> Over the next week, if you've got a couple of hours to spare, walk into a bank. <laughs> and just stand there all day doing nothing. You'll be shot dead by lunchtime. <laughs> what are you doing there? I'm doing nuts. <laughs> Why have you got a balaclava on your head? I've got a drop of tea left in my mouth and I'm trying to keep it warm. <laughs> no, it just... Things are crazy everywhere. You have to decide what kind of a life you want to live and what's good for your head and good for your body and good for your soul. It might be the same thing that's good for your wallet, but you have to decide stuff. You know, said he, charging nine pound a fucking ticket. But you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I sometimes think, think, the older you get, the more conservative you become. I'm 33 years of age and I'm, I'm not as wild as I used to be. I know you're looking at me now saying, oh, he's fantastic crack. I'm not fucking like this all the time. <laughs> get up in the morning, good morning, children! <laughs> Does Daddy want to have breakfast with you or what? Come on! <laughs> you know, but... <laughs> you know, you'd be shot. You know. So, and I do think the older you become, the more conservative you become, and you, you get stuff. Like, I have this hobo soul. I have this... I, I, I have this... The imagination of, of the wandering tramp and, and somebody who likes to vision himself as a kind of a O'Rahala or a raftery, the wandering and going touching people and stuff. But it's, it's very, I have a mortgage and I have three children and an adult and I've got a car. <laughs> Do you know? I have a hobo soul, but children bring you down to earth big time. Driving in town the other day, my three year old son, we were driving past a house and said, Oh, look, daddy, look, 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 daddy, daddy, look, look, look. A house stuck to another one. <laughs> <laughs> That's ridiculous, isn't it, Daddy? <laughs> so I think I'm just becoming safer in my head, you know? I've got one friend left from my early 20s who is still the same way. His name is Declan Moffat. And he's still as wild. He comes from Glen and Maddie, and he's just, he's just wild. He has this ferocious kind of sexual energy, but it's not wrapped up in any charm. <laughs> 
It's in its raw, unprocessed state. <laughs> Women find him repulsive. Give us a go, you knocker, come on! Hey. <laughs> but he's, you know, and, you know, it just, it, I like hanging around with him in retrospect. <laughs> like, after he's been, you know, it just upsets everybody when he goes, come on, out that book, tell me that lock, come on! <laughs> Which I can hardly go out now, Declan. Look, it's a quarter past nine. Oh. <laughs> I think at the type of person he is now. We were, um, I was over doing some work in London uh, for the IRA. <laughs> or the BBC, or one of those companies. I was doing some work over, I was doing some work over in London. And um, uh, after the gig was over, um, uh, the television thing, they flew me back uh, from Heathrow to Dublin Airport, first class, and they gave me an extra ticket to take one of my smelly Irish friends out of their lovely city. And um, <laughs> so I, I took Declan. Now, the, the night before, when the gig finished, we just got hammered drunk and it was just bleary-eyed and up till 7 o'clock in the morning drinking and stuff. Got an hour of sleep, slept in our clothes, next thing. Brr, 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 taxi here, oh God almighty. So gathered our <laughs> went down a bleary-eyed blood everywhere. We looked like <laughs> children's feet scattered about the room. I don't remember that at all. Uh, <laughs> we looked like two young fellas who'd failed the audition for the Wolf Tones. <laughs> Into the taxi, over to the airport. Everybody else was on the plane. We were late, and first class because everybody's so posh with their big hair and massive newspapers and really small fingers. <laughs> and so, <laughs> <laughs> so, all, so I sit into my seat, and Declan is there. He's got a bag of oranges, which he's bringing back as a present <laughs> <laughs> to his nephews and nieces in Glenamady. Oranges from London. Oh yeah. But he's finding the fierce difficult to coordinate, opening the flap and putting his oranges Ah, fuck you. Anyway, so he sits down beside me. Now, do you know when you're that hungover and you know what you want to say, you can see the sentence in front of you. <laughs> but it just takes too much effort. So what you, you, just, you pick out a couple of words <laughs> and, and you throw them together and you hope it makes sense. <laughs> now, what he meant to say, what he meant to say to me was, did you ever make love to your girlfriend. Come home and make love to your girlfriend, when initially, she doesn't really want to be made love to. You know, you're kind of, hey. You're kind of working on the charming side of aggressive. Hey, oh, oh hey. Right. But that took too much mental thought. So you must also remember that his ears had popped. <laughs> and he had no idea how loud he was actually speaking. He turns to me and he roars out, Did you ever rape someone? <laughs> We're up 29,000 feet. The pilot, <laughs> he puts the plane into reverse. I'm dropping this fucker back. I don't care. He's also somebody, he's kind of, he has no idea <laughs> of his own uh, limitations, I suppose. Uh, he just he thinks he can do everything. He thinks he's going to be brilliant at everything. He decided recently he was going to run in the Southampton Marathon. It was near where he was living in England at the time. And he would take no dissuading whatsoever. You know, he trained for about a week. <laughs> Try off and ran 26 miles and I was drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Looking for a party. <laughs> I'll probably win the fucking thing. <laughs> so, the start of the race, where does the bow Declan go? Not at the back. With all the humble amateur athletes dressed up as restaurants and werewolves. No, Declan has a chance of winning the fucking thing. So, he elbows his way down to the front and he stands there, stomach against the ticker tape, shoulder to shoulder with all the boys from Somalia and Kenya. <laughs> Declan Moffat, Glenn and Maddie, the best you love. <laughs> Jesus, there isn't a pick on you. <laughs> Will you have a ham sandwich? Ah, ah. Are we going past the chipper or what? Ah, <laughs> They're all there in their sleek Adidas outfits. Singlets, shiny shorts and trainers with spikes in them. Declan is there in a Saw Doctor's t-shirt. <laughs> 
He has the sleeves torn off for aerodynamic purposes by... <laughs> now, the race starts. He said that he was able to keep up with them for the first four miles. Now, now that's an achievement. Because those fellas don't hang around. They just go... Hey, oh. It's like they're made out of gazelles. They're just... Whoa, whoa. And Brendan there... After four miles, he said he got so tired that he wasn't able to slow down. <laughs> he said that if he didn't come to an abrupt stop, he was going to die. So... Rather than kind of stand to one side and to be seen like a bit of a fool, he spotted a ditch, right? <laughs> And he very suddenly and dramatically just veered off course and leapt into it without a word of explanation to his fellow athletes. <laughs> what has happened to Declan? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. He was scaring me. <laughs> Me too, me too. Was he the devil? I don't know. I don't know. I like to run. So do I, so do I. <laughs> the, um, so it's, it's good, it's good to have that. It's good to have that bit of kind of lunacy in your life. One of the interesting things about September the 11th, 1982, uh, <laughs> one of the interesting things about September the 11th last year was um, watching the telly that Tuesday afternoon. Now, this is before, you know, you might have heard of people that you knew or nearly knew or just sad human stories coming out of it. It's always, it's fucking always the ordinary Joe soaps that get busted. No matter what kind of conflict it is, all the fuckers are going to work to get blown up. Anyway. The interesting thing about September 11th, right, before all the stories, that afternoon, okay, when we're watching the television, and we're there and it's compelling and it's just this televisual spectacle before it's a, it's a human heartbreak, it's, oh, gee, wow, what the fuck, oh, oh, and you've all these headlines coming on, these screaming Sky News headlines with the, with, with the black backdrop and the white letters, Jenny Mac, Holy Magoli! Or whatever the Irish is for jihad. Oh, my goodness! What do you mean? Oh, the world is fucked! The world is fucked! Oh, what the fuck did they do that for? The world is fucked! Ah. So, during the ads... <laughs> I went out into the kitchen to make a cup of tea. <laughs> and I looked out the window... <coughs> and, and everything was grand. <laughs> there was... Rabbits and <laughs> trees and, and, and children, and I was kind of confused. And I said, huh. So I knew that there, uh, there was kind of a crisis, and I knew I had to make a decision. Which world was I going to live in? <laughs> was I going to spend my life volunteering for sorrow, watching news and getting all the bad stuff, or was I going to live in my own little wrapped up world, not know what was going on in the rest of the world? I decided to do neither. I decided to make a compromise. What I did was I went in to the sitting room and I, and I, and I, I left the television on, but I switched it over to the Teletubbies. <laughs> right? And then I went out into the back garden, right? And I got all the children around me in a big, huge circle. And I looked at them and I said, The world is full! What are you investing for? <laughs> well, while, while I was in New York, I went to, uh, went to the planetarium, which was a bewildering experience. Bewildering because I got to go on a tour of space. There's this big, massive, huge golf ball of a kind of a dome thing, and it's filled with seats every which way, and from halfway up all the way around is this magical, bendy cinema screen. And you go on this tour of space, and it starts off in knock. <laughs> it, starts off, it, it, it starts off and you see the world 
And the world, I don't know you know this already, but the world is so beautiful when you look. It's, it's, it's just this blue spinning ball with no strings and it's our house. <laughs> and it's just lovely and it's just... Always moving, even when you're fast asleep, you think you're still, you're not. You're on a big ball going... <laughs> and then we got to look at all the other planets in our solar system. And compared to them, we're singing because they're all, they're all covered in dust and bricks and just ugly stuff and nothing really. They don't have rabbits. <laughs> they don't have trees and they certainly don't have children. <laughs> so then we got to look at all the other solar systems that exist in our galaxy, right? And there's hundreds of them. Hundreds and thousands of solar systems with suns that would dwarf ours. Our sun would just be a phlegm on your brother's jacket. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember when you used to do that? You spent four years in segments going, <laughs> <laughs> so there's, you know, and, and there's planets much bigger. There's planets with 19 moons. 19 moons. You'd never get a wink of fucking sleep. <laughs> but like sleeping under floodlights, you know. And <laughs> then we got to look, right, at all the other galaxies that exist in our universe. And there's millions of them! <laughs> Vaster and more expansive than our one. Then! I mean, I'm in tears now at this stage. Then we get to look at all the other universes, apart from our one, and there's millions of them! <laughs> then we get to look at all the other universes that we don't know about, but that we fucking know about. <laughs> and the rest then was just space. And I came to the conclusion that far from being the centre of things, far from being important, far from being even relevant, nobody knows we're here. <laughs> Wreck the joint. <laughs> nobody knows we're here. Nobody knows why we're here. Nobody knows how we're here. If everybody who had ever lived ever was able to stand up at the same time and say the word hello in the same language, nobody would hear us. This is it, folks. This is life. It's just me and you and the rabbits and the trees and the children. That's all. So, what do you think of it? <laughs> it's not always great, is it, life? It's stressful everywhere. Fucking noise and people are so overrated, aren't they? <laughs> There's nothing... They say life is fucking short and the wrong company can let it do fucking long. <laughs> I'm trying to find a, a type of music that adequately expresses what it's like to be alive. I've been getting into jazz. You know, uh, and not, this, not ordinary jazz, it's this type of jazz that I can only actually listen to uh, for a few minutes. It's called free jazz. It's kind of, um, it's everybody plays whatever they want, whenever they want. There's no rules or laws. You say, oh, wait, what do I just do? And it's, it's, it's supposed to be cool. It kind of sounds like a fire in a pet shop. <laughs> <laughs> so I, but I got to go to a gig. Uh, a free jazz gig in a place called the Village Vanguard, one of the most famous jazz clubs in the world in New York. And uh, I go down the steps, this basement club, and on the wall there's all these cool photographs of all these cool people. And jazz photography is just so, everyone is just so, looks so great. And it's all cigarettes, smoke, and sharp suits, and Miles Davis, John Contrail, Charles Mingus, and... <laughs> Did you think, do you ever think that would the cores be half as popular if they were called the Mongans? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Mr. President, I'd like you to meet the Mongans. <laughs> but anyway, they're all, it's all there, and it's cigarette smoke, sharp suits, and yeah. 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 Not like photographs of Irish musicians. <laughs> <laughs> Mick Flavin here, hello. <laughs>
ding 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 So, the, at the jazz gig, and after a while, I sit down in my seat, and the band come on the stage, and they don't run on like a pop band going, love me, love me, love me. They, they walk on. You can love me if you like, I'm not in a rush. <laughs> And they're all black, and the fact that they're black makes, makes it cooler. And I don't know why that is, but it just does. And it's interesting what's happened to black people in America over the past 120 years. Isn't it? <laughs> uh oh, oh, Tommy, please help, please help. <laughs> My head is going to burst, please help. 120 years ago, black people in America were kept in, in, in they were sent, kept in sheds and sent out into the fields and whipped and kicked and bet and shoved back into the sheds and maybe they'd grope a feel off one of the good looking ones during the night. <laughs> I'm only telling you what you already know, don't be. <laughs> but now it's, it's just, it's just how, it's interesting to me, just the sociological journey that's involved there, you know. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking, what's the parallel with Ireland? You know, in 120 years' time, are our great, great, great grandchildren all going to want to be tinkers? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no way, Tommy. I'm telling you, it's going to happen. <laughs> Wasn't Brad Pitt the coolest tinker you ever saw in your life? <laughs> in the movie, our descendants are going to want to do that. Standing by the side of the road, leather jackets, leather hats, loads of rings, trying to sell gates to strangers. <laughs> Top up, high boss. Hey, no, no, it's all about that. <laughs> Watching reruns of Blackie Connor's wedding on Glen Row. Oh, no, no, no. Hey, somebody never die, Connor. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Parents get no upset. I don't want you talking like that anymore, Justin. Just not my name no more, mammy, no. <laughs> I want to be known by my sham name, Hatchets. <laughs> so the band are there. They all get behind their instruments, and they're just real kind of. And the lead guy comes up to the mic, he kind of just a real shuffle. Lovely deep black skin, white hair, looks like a pint of Guinness. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Y'all very welcome to the village man got the four and the five and the five and the four is over and up and come back with the simple with the simple with the simple with the crazy guys some jazz. <laughs> We're going to play some songs for you this evening, ladies and gentlemen. Before we do, just want to introduce you to the members of the band. On the bass, we got the face of the bass of the grace of the chase. I can't remember where we was going over it. It's a mass of crazy gas in Alabama, 954 with two Kelly did or something like that. I was in a car with a white lady. There's a man banging on the door. He said, stop doing that to her. I said, I'm not doing anything to her, brother. <laughs> She's doing it all to me. <laughs> on the drums, we got maybe some... Uh, <laughs> Looks like I drifted away there for a minute. <laughs> on the drums and on the, on the saxophone, we got maybe some you be familiar with uh, Sunny Rollins and Diamonds on the Bridge. <laughs> John Gold Dream, maybe that's going to make some stand guess. Uh, <laughs> we're going to do a little song for you now. Called uh, <laughs> we don't know what it's called. Uh, 
uh, maybe something like Paris or something. You know. <laughs> Thank you very much. I hope you're dancing cool as ever. And they start. And the interesting thing is that when they start, you think you understand it. Because there are, they seem to be all playing from the same hymn sheet. But the lunacy starts uh, when they start doing their solos. And during the solo, you can do whatever you want, whenever you want. The least amount of sense it makes, the better. So all they're kind of playing away. And the first to go is the drummer for his solo. So, ba -dum -bum, ba -dum -bum, ba -dum -bum, on and on and on for about the duration of Lent. <laughs> At some unknown secret signal, bless the fucking van join in there. Right? Then, then the bass player gets his go. <laughs> he sounded like somebody who's trying to remember a tune. Every time he got two notes that went against it, ah, no, that's not it. <laughs> Again, they all fucking know when to join, OK, to join in. Then the trumpet player, and, on a, and then the last to go was the saxophone player. Now, I have never in my life heard a noise like this coming out of a saxophone. <laughs> I've seen Sade videos. I know what saxophones are supposed to sound like. <laughs> Without a word of warning, this aural sodomy began, right? Just, Wee, wee. Wee, 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 wee. There's blood coming out of his ears. Wee, wee. It would have made more sense if he put the saxophone down and made the noise with his mouth. Wee, wee. Wee. <laughs> the last time I had heard a noise like that was from a donkey in distress. <laughs> but it happened, it happened. I, was, I was living out in Inishmoor for a while and I was, um, I was going, I was 18, and I was going out with this island girl. <laughs> and she wasn't used to men like me. She was used to big, rough fishermen. Men with massive calluses in their hands, hooks stuck in their faces. <laughs> Young fellas have been lifting boats from the age of two and a half. Roar! <laughs> and I came into her life this East Coast poet. <laughs> Never did a day's work in his life. I get blisters pointing. <laughs> and I played the part of the poet for her. I love Patrick Kavanagh, I used to recite it for her. In Nishkeen Road, July evening. There was a dance. In Billy Brennan's barn tonight, <laughs> the bicycles go by in twos and threes. <laughs> no one on them, just these fucking bicycles. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine the scene, okay? It's a, just during the summer, it's about half past twelve at night. We're walking along the main road on Ishmore. There's a big, beautiful Connemara moon out there, a big bull bull-bellied white thing. The stars are shining like angels' teeth. The Atlantic Ocean is crashing off the rocks on one side of the island. It's creeping up the shingle-filled beach on the other. The lights of mainland Ireland in the distance. Connemara. <laughs> Later frack to Ross Mook. <laughs> I was on my bicycle. <laughs> And I was vomiting. <laughs> I was vomiting vodka. <laughs> so I went home and I watched the well of wishing. <laughs> so that's the scene. We're walking home, we're holding hands. I'm asking her not to squeeze so fucking tightly. <laughs> So we're, 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 I'm going to walk her home to her, to her house, give her a kiss, and, and maybe go back to the temporary accommodation where I'm staying. We're walking along. Next thing we hear this noise, right? There's no street lamps, or it's, it's kind of a wild landscape. We hear this noise. Wee -wee! Wee -wee! Accompanied by the sound of hooves. Wee -wee! 
Woo-hoo! I thought it was the four donkeys of the apocalypse. <laughs> She's bigger than me. I just stood behind her for a moment just to get that. <laughs> I didn't know. Woo-hoo! What the fuck is that? I was going through the audio files in my head looking for a match. There was nothing. Woo-hoo! What the fuck is that? And the things when you're you you. When you're in an odd environment, you expect anything. I wouldn't have been surprised to see a banshee or something. So imagine, imagine you're lost in the mountains of some remote part of Ireland and it's late at night and the wind is blowing, the rain is beating against your face and you're holding a stick and you're looking... You're looking for your friend or something. And, and you walk around the corner, right? And there, there, sitting on a rock, just puffing an old pipe, a little is a fucking leprechaun. Just, you, know, you give him a kick and he says, fuck off, will you? And, <laughs> now, part of you would be going, holy Jesus, it's a leprechaun. But part of your brain would be going, but of course. <laughs> Where else would you find one? <laughs> so I don't know what to expect. The two of us are frozen. Well, <laughs> Next thing, this donkey. <laughs> Woo! And when I say flying past, I mean it. His ears are zing. <laughs> Nostrils blaring. <laughs> He's doing that thing with the eyes. Do you ever see a horse running madly? It, it never looks all the way around and goes, will you please stop? It, it, just, it just kind of goes, Wah! Wah! <laughs> And as he flew past us, we could see what was wrong with him. He'd obviously, earlier on in the day, <laughs> eaten a massive sheet of industrial plastic, right? <laughs> Horrible, about the size of a pool table, right? And I don't know how clever donkeys are, but he should have known a bite or two into it that it wasn't the greatest idea he'd ever had. Maybe he said, ah, fuck it, I'm a donkey. <laughs> I presume about quarter to 12 that night he started to get the odd cramp. <laughs> oh, I just, I'd forgotten about that, oh God. <laughs> Didn't want to tell the other donkeys what was wrong with them. Because then he'd have to tell them what he'd done, and it is hard enough being a donkey <laughs> without being a fool of a donkey. <laughs> so he said to them, I'm just going for a walk, and he had this vision of burying his head in a rabbit hole on the other side of the aisle, and he was getting this thing, <laughs> no one would hear him to see his petrified rabbits going, what the hell is that? <laughs> so he went off for a walk, right? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and the worst the pain got, all he could think of doing was moving quicker. Oh, Jesus, no. Um, worse and worse and faster and faster. By the time he came past us, he did not give a fuck. <laughs> he woke up the whole island. I don't care anymore. <laughs> and we listened and listened and listened until we heard a splash. <laughs> We think, we, we think, well, we, we thought, dude, one, 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 he's either just, we thought he had a cape and could fly, <laughs> like super donkey or something, I don't know. <gasps> um, the other thing was that he may have committed suicide. <laughs> Initially, we thought it was funny. <laughs> we were going, <laughs> oh, donkey. <laughs> we thought about it some more and said, well, you know, Something's after dying, and you know, it's, it's a bit sad, isn't it? And then we thought about it some more, and said, no, fuck it, right the first time. <laughs> so we, even though I couldn't understand the jazz music, and even though... <laughs> yes, it's almost like I've worked these stories out before, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and I couldn't understand it, it, it and I, it couldn't make sense to me, and that's the only thing I could compare it to. It still kind of inspired me because it didn't, it didn't make sense and life doesn't make sense and it's chaotic and, you know, we're just in it for each other, you know, and that's all there's to be said, really, <laughs> or else I'll weep. Um, <laughs> it's very different to Irish traditional music. Uh, jazz 
is about one person getting up on his own and saying, I am mad, take it or leave it. <laughs> Irish trad is a lot more inclusive. Irish or fuck it or walk, we're all mad, come on. <laughs> it's very different as well, the instruments, so all the instruments in, in Irish trad are, it's a very organic thing, they're all made out of dead animals. You know, so see, years ago, an animal would die and the music people would run over quick <laughs> before the hungry people found out. <laughs> They'd flick out the nipples with a penknife, right? Put their fingers over the holes, shove a head of lettuce up its arse to stop the air going out that way. Turn it upside down and with this arm squeeze. And as the air is going past the nipples, you modulate a tune. Deadly idle idle loodle 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 Deadly idle idle loodle loodle So we say you're in some pub some night, okay? Some pub down the west side or something, the crane or something, some, some pub like that. It's packed. It's gently packed. And the music is just, it starts off, but it's, it's not too fast. It's kind of swift and mischievous. It's kind of moving between the people like a curl of smoke, just kind of pulling them together slowly without them even noticing. Deadly idle idle oodle 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 Deadly idle idle oodle 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 And people there, how are you doing? Isn't it great to be out? Woo! Deadly idle idle oodle 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 Will you have a drink? So why wouldn't I? Deadly idle idle oodle 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 Deadly idle idle oodle 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 You're looking great, thanks very much. There's your one, she's a fine looking bird, isn't she? Oh, she is, but she's a thunder bitch to live with. <laughs> Deadly idle idle oodle on oodle on. Deadly idle idle oodle on oodle on. Deadly idle idle oodle Slowly but surely. Deadly idle idle oodle on oodle on. 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 Deadly idle idle oodle on Faster and faster, and you start to think, fucking hell, the drink is flying into you now. Oh, I'm on top of daily island, and you don't know how you arrived here, but you're fucking delighted. Don't stop now, oh, come on, daily island. And you're thinking if the music is fast enough and if we drink enough, maybe, just maybe, we'll break on through <laughs> to the other side. Dun, 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 Faster and faster and faster and faster. People getting wild and pagan now. Letting their hair, ah, doing things they wouldn't normally allow themselves to do. Picking up children. <laughs> Little Fanta-filled fuckers. <laughs> up by the ankles and just <laughs> Did you see the spin I put on that lad? <laughs> You've employed a man with eyes pointing in two different directions to drive around the town picking up homeless waves, luring them into the van with the promise of free Fanta, filling them up till they're all giddy and fizzy, bringing them to the back door of the pub. I'm going to have a fresh match. Good man yourself, Seamus. Come here to be you, you little fucking frisbee. Yay! Yeah! <laughs> People aren't drinking the drinks on their own anymore. The barman has turned the taps up and... <laughs> and... You're thinking, maybe this is it. Maybe this is the session to end all sessions. <laughs> The one that I've read about in the great book. <laughs> the session that is our birthright. <laughs> We're slowly. We won't know it. Because we'll all be demented. <laughs> the pub will lift off the ground. We'll have made contact with some spirit from the other world. <laughs> the pub will lift off the ground. Go up, 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 up. We're going to break free of the Earth's atmosphere. We're going to open the doors. We're going to walk out into the cosmos to become the space paddy bog people. <laughs> 
that nature intended us to be. While I was in the planetarium, I found out that everything that exists inside a universe is made in the center of that universe by a star. Therefore, we are the stuff that stars are made of. I can't tell. into this whirling dervish. Faster and faster and faster and faster. And we'd be lost in some kind of wonderful lunatic reverie. Come here and I ride you now. You're the bull, you're the bull, you're the bull, you're the bull. You've me heart broke, Christy Brown. Sometimes I think you are me heart. It's a horse, Tato. It's a horse. <laughs> you could do worse than spend an evening in the field with a tinker's daughter. Sure, you wouldn't be your father if he didn't bait you. When I am gone, who'll take my place? And just when you think it's going to happen, just when we're fucking ready, all of a sudden the music has to stop. <laughs> We thought we were just slowing down, coming to a bend. Deadly, I'd like, 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 but it stops. Because now it's time for a sad song. And there's always a couple of foreigners in the pub who don't understand what's happening. <laughs> And this old woman, about 400 years of age, made out of a potato. We are. You don't know if she's singing Egyptian or being interfered with. We are. Sounds like the Muslim call to prayer. All the workers from the local halal factory have left the night shift. <laughs> are walking towards the pub. This is very unusual for the hour of the night. <laughs> <laughs> the boats are gone. <laughs> the fish are gone. <laughs> Where are they gone? I don't know. And after she's finished her long lament, we can begin the fast music again, but it's too late because we know we're not going to be allowed to go all the way. And people are beginning to feel a bit self-conscious now. Especially about the huge lump of semi-concussed children up against the wall. <laughs> but I, I, I think... I think that what the idea is, right, that you need a bit of sadness. I think, I need, you know, you need a little bit. You know, I mean, you couldn't be happy all the time. Not in this country, anyway. <laughs> You'd have no friends for a start. <laughs> oh, here he comes. <laughs> the happy fucker. <laughs> but the great thing about music is that it allows you to become spirit just for a little while. And music is very corporate these days. This old MP, I'm so fed up paying 24 99 for a disc of shit. <laughs> this old MP3 thing. These high-powered music executives who are telling us to stop downloading music from the internet. You can't be having that stuff for free. We've got billionaires to protect. <laughs> and I say, fuck them. Let's keep doing it. For every Napster and Papster they destroy, we'll employ another one of Donald Duck's nephews to take his place. <laughs> These people are only trying to scare us, folks. You know, we've been through this before. I don't know if many of you remember the whole taping songs from the radio crisis. <laughs> And how that nearly crippled the music industry. Ha <laughs> ha, we had them worried then, didn't we? Us in our bedrooms with our lunchbox shaped tape recorders. Pressed up as close to the radio as physically possible, while at the same time getting everybody downstairs to please be quiet. <laughs> One thumb over the play button. 
the other thumb over the record button. You had to use all your physical strength and coordination to get both buttons pressed down at the same time. There was some kind of special Mickey Spring loaded device on the record button. If you got the timing wrong on that, you could dislocate your shoulder. <laughs> Hovering over the two buttons, waiting for the DJ to shut the fuck up. <laughs> and, and, and all for what? What was the fantastic music we wanted to download <laughs> during the 80s? <laughs> you see, we weren't cool like kids from the 60s, or the 70s, or the 90s, no. We were reincarnations of kids from the 50s. <laughs> Innocent and naive, and they had Bill Haley. And we, we made a millionaire, a millionaire out of Shaken Stevens. <laughs> Nothing against the man, but we it's just, we looked at him, we were so daft. We thought that Shaken Stevens was as wild <laughs> and as radical as any human being could possibly be without exploding. <laughs> oh, Shaken Stevens, man, oh yeah. <laughs> and all his songs were about DIY. <laughs> this old house don't need a window. That's right! The windows on this house are grand, Shaken. Tell it from the mountaintop. We're right behind you, you fucking rebel, yeah. <laughs> There's an old piano and they play it hot behind the green door. Did you hear that, Mummy and Daddy? A fucking green door. <laughs> you don't know my life. It's good to remember stuff, though. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it is. Maybe, you know. Wouldn't be a big fan of photographs now. Or looking, you could look back too much. You become, your head becomes all meddled and no, it's only now and it's only today. And, but my dad is weird. Um, <laughs> my dad said something to me weird the other day. He said, any time, Tom, that I, that I, that I, I can't sleep, <clears throat> I try to remember something that I've never remembered before. <laughs> it's a bewildering thing to try and do. I, I tried it. I, I, I remember getting a lift uh, from this... Um, I was hitched up from Cork one time, and I remember getting a lift with this massive, massive... Uh, born again Christian, this hu huge, he was such a fat man, he was massive. He was one of the happiest people I've ever met. And he was, we were driving up bit of cock, and he says, I've, a cock, I found Jesus. <laughs> to me, the cock accent always sounds like Tinker's trying to speak French. <laughs> I found Jesus, but I found him. And he was saying to me, um, what, what are you thinking about right now? And I couldn't tell him, because I was thinking about what it must be like to, to be that fat and to make love to somebody. And, and <laughs> I, I don't know whether it's... I'm, I'm watching a lot of Italian movies or something, but I'm, I'm starting to develop a grow for bigger women. <laughs> bigger, not like women who've let themselves go or anything, but, you know, just big, kind of, you know, like a little giver and a... Do you know what I mean? Not a thump, but you can kind of... Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? The kind of more amply fleshed women. Uh, do you know? <laughs> <laughs> There's an awful lot of pressure on not just women uh, to be thin. There's an awful lot of pressure on men to look like, uh, you know, attractive. <laughs> <laughs> you know what the fuck, like, we just like sitting around looking at our stomachs. What the fuck is that? But there is, you know, there's pressure on... And you see some really skinny women you know, and you think, my God, 
you know. And he'd, he just loved to, he'd love to go over and give them a hug and say, have a sandwich or something. <laughs> Bit of melted cheese on it. Go on. Uh, knock, knock yourself out there, would you? I'm not very good at sex. Um, don't mind telling you that, because we won't be making love. Uh, <laughs> No, I'm not very good at it. I, I, uh, I'm just not. That's it. I, I, I don't have to be. Well, I ought to be, but I, I, she never says anything. <laughs> which is the problem. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I'm not wild in bed. I know some of you look up at me now thinking I'm a superstar sex god. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm really... I'm, I could be wild in a kind of a controlled environment, uh, you know. <laughs> I could be wild under medical supervision. But <laughs> I was a very, um, I was a very late comer. <laughs> uh, what I mean by that now, I'm, 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 I'm not able to delay. Uh, I mean that I was 16 and a half uh, when I came for the very first time. And th I know that's old. I do know. I, I, I know there's men in here who have come three or four times their own body weight by the time they're 16 and a half. <laughs> they could have life-size sperm replicas of themselves. <laughs> like the fella from Terminator. I'm a puddle. I'm a truck. I'm a puddle. I'm a truck. <laughs> the reason it took me so long to come was because I had tried it loads of times and just found it very, 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 very boring. Nothing was ever happening. I felt stupid. I'm obviously doing it wrong or I'm made wrong. I'm some kind of eunuchy gimp. But this is giving me no pleasure or satisfaction whatsoever. And I'd be explaining this to some of my teachers. <laughs> you know, and they, they didn't have, but my classmates gave me so much encouragement. Go on, Tommy, you have to keep trying it. It's worth it in the end. I swear to God, keep going for one day. You'll do it. Yeah. Why, why don't you try it in the bath? It might help you relax. I'll say, Yes, I'll try it in the back. Thanks very much. And the headmaster would give me a half day. <laughs> We'd like to wish Tommy Tiernan the best of luck. He's going home to try and come for the very first time. Would all the boys in 2B2 please go to the woodwork room now? So I, I'd run home and I'd burst in the kitchen door and say, Mommy, I'm going up to have a bat. And she'd know right well what I was at. And she'd be there, Oh, please, oh, please, oh, please, let today be the day. <laughs> So I get up and I get into the bath and I went for it. I went for it like I have never gone for it before in my life. And nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. No sensations, nothing. I just saw oh, fuck. <laughs> oh, man, I just have tried now and <sighs> I have, and I've given my best go and I... <clears throat> <laughs> then I started shoving soap up my arse. <laughs> Fuck it, I was in the bath, I was up for divilment. <laughs> and and, and the, the fantastic thing about shoving soap up your bottom is you don't have to practice. The first time you try, you'll probably succeed. <laughs> If we want to, the night is young and so am I. So, to mark this special occasion, I would like to tell you about the very first time that I came. Uh, like I said, I was 16 and a half. Um, at the age of 16, I was sent away to boarding school. The reason I was sent away to boarding school was because in my Christmas exams in St. Patrick's Classical School in Navan, <laughs> my highest mark was 21%. <laughs> now, I know in some parts of Connemara they would class me as some type of intellectual, but... <laughs> so my parents got all worried and frustrated, so they sent me off to Garbley College in Ballinasloe. I was there for three and a half months, and I went back to Navan for my Christmas holidays, and I hooked up with the girl I was going out with before I was sent away. It was a very, very highly charged evening, and I felt as if something extra had been added onto my life. You know, I wasn't like the other boys now. I had, I'd, be, I'd left Nav and I'd been away. I'd been to Ballinasloe. <laughs> Way! 
fucking... Eat that fucking Ray Fiennes. Hey! <laughs> so, highly charged evening, her parents went out for the night. She took me upstairs to her bedroom, and the two of us got undressed. And I think of that night now, it sends a shiver up my spine. I can never believe that I was... First of all, I can never believe that I was actually 16. I can never believe that I was with a naked 16-year-old girl. <laughs> <laughs> and if I knew then what I know now, I would have stayed longer. I would have... <laughs> so the two of us are standing there naked, OK? <laughs> and, and, and I have an erection, OK? Right? Not now! <laughs> I'll give you all a moment to look. There you go. Check it out. So, I've got an erection, and I'm trying to make her feel kind of comfortable. You know? Women don't understand that men get erections all the time. You don't have to be feeling particularly randy to get them. You just fucking get them. All hours of the day and night. You wake up in the morning, first thing, what have you got? An erection. Why? I don't know. Sure, there might be an old vagina lying around the place somewhere. <laughs> you could lash it into that for a bit of crack. <laughs> so I'm trying to make her feel comfortable. All she can see is this thumping bloodhead in front of her. So she makes me lie down on the, ca on, on, on the bed. She sits across my thighs. She says, Tommy, we're not going to go the whole way because it's too risky. I went, right, what are you talking about? <laughs> We're staying here, is that what you mean? <laughs> now, it's a big night for her too. I know a few ladies remember this in your, uh, in your, in your growing up life, but you remember the night that it, you, you were with in this kind of situation and you weren't going to have sex, but you wanted to be able to, whatever needed to be done, <laughs> You wanted to be able to do it. You didn't want to be known as the girl who wanted... You know, you think, you're thinking to yourself, if men can do it to themselves, it can't be that fucking hard. <laughs> so... <laughs> so she's sitting there and she's looking at it and she, she's nervous. She's not really impressed by its beauty. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like an uncomfortable chicken or something. I don't know. <laughs> So she's there, she's looking at it. She's aware that the first touch could be crucial. <laughs> she's there. She gives it a flick. <laughs> no response. Oh, she gives it a slap. <laughs> no response. She pulls it down to one side and she lets it. <laughs> no response. And she says, All right. Just go for it. She grabs a hold of it like you would a trout. <laughs> and with a really serious look on her face, <laughs> starts <to> really quickly. <laughs> oh. If only we had some soap! <laughs> I can show her a thing or two! Then! I, I, I get this kind of... <laughs> this kind of unfamiliar, but somehow unmistakable... <laughs> ...sensation just going kind of, kind of up and into me a little bit. And, and I realise that I'm about to come for the very first time. Now, in the boarding school in Garbley, I had just finished reading a book. Right, called The Happy Hustler. For those of you who don't know it, it's kind of like the, it's the brother book to The Happy Hooker. It's a short, pornographic novella. It's about this guy, right, who has a massive cock. <laughs> and how he travels around America, fucking everybody, <laughs> with his massive cock. That's the synopsis, should it ever appear in the leave search, right? <laughs> Even when I was a kid, I knew there was something different about me. 
we'd be getting changed in the locker room and all the other boys would be going, oh! and I'd go, what? And they go, you've got a massive cock. <laughs> so I decided to fuck everybody with my massive cock. A typical scenario would be, I went to visit my cousin in the country. They had a maid. She wasn't wearing any knickers. I... <laughs> through she turned to say to me you've got it. I said I know I know I know <laughs> but I didn't come inside of the oh no way I pulled out just in time so I could see the hot spunk the spunk the spunk like lava <laughs> 40 50 feet of spunk the barn was drenched <laughs> spunk at I spunk at I spunk oh from my mouth of cock So that's what I was expecting. <laughs> I turned to the girl and I said, listen, listen to me quick, we don't have much time. <laughs> Number one, when it comes out, don't touch us cause it's roasting hot. <laughs> Secondly, grip me tightly about the thighs. I was expecting kind of a high velocity Kalashnikov type ejaculation. I was <laughs> worried about being propelled from underneath her body out through the door and into the bathroom. <laughs> like some high-powered swamp boat. Jesus! <laughs> Can you imagine my disappointment? <laughs> I didn't so much come as my cock coughed. I have something stuck in my throat here. I don't know what it is. You'd got more liquid from a camel retching in the desert. <laughs> if you can imagine a one-eyed mouse <laughs> weeping. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. So I don't know if any women in the room know this. Us men think you're fantastic in, in a kind of, as, as a kind of species. Uh, individually, you're fucking hard work. But <laughs> as a species, men think women are amazing. And, and, and we have very different reactions to beauty. You know, a group of women could be standing around together sewing or smelling things. And <laughs> a, 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 a lovely man would walk past, and it's kind of seen as a thing of celebration. It's kind of, would you look at him in the big stroll on him? Look at that. <laughs> and you give him the old butterfly eyes, how are you? <laughs> and it's, you can you'd enjoy that. A group of men can be standing Fleming on a dwarf or something. <laughs> and, <laughs> and <laughs> God is in the details. And, uh, and, and a beautiful woman walked past, and it's not, does it? It's, it, it's fucking painful. <laughs> Would you look at your one where, ah, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Ooh. But in general, we think you're fantastic, you know, and some of the, the best nights of a man's life are the ones where uh, his woman friend. <laughs> very hard to negotiate these uh, hazards. Um, his woman friend person equal in everything. Uh, <laughs> Uh, lovely thing, wiser, more radiant, Buddha. <laughs> thing, woman, I don't know, you, lady. Anyway, um, when, do you know guys, those nights when she, those perfect nights that, you know, she's been out with a friend or two. She had a bottle of wine or something, you know. She comes back, it's about quarter past 12 or something. You've been in the house all evening, right? You put the kids to bed, you fill the dishwasher without being asked to. Um, <laughs> little miracles everywhere. And, uh, and she, she comes in and she has that kind of uh, <laughs> glint in her eye and she takes off her coat and she drops it to the floor and you're going, ho, 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 ho. <laughs> She says, there'll be no coats being picked up in here tonight, sailor. <laughs> I knew 
you don't know what the fuck you've done to deserve this special treatment and you're afraid to speak in case you fuck it up. <laughs> so she undoes the buttons of her blouse. <laughs> I've been drinking. <laughs> Opens up her blouse, she, then she pulls out the leafy bits of the bra, the, the bit that goes over the belly of the breast. I don't know, I've never fucking built one, I don't know what they're called. And the cross your heart, shut your hole bra. <laughs> so she, she pulls it down and she shows you her breast and she says, she says, Tell me you like them. Tell me you like them. And you're really worried now because you have to talk. And <laughs> I like them. Am I through to the next round? <laughs> she, she undoes a button here, pulls down as if the skirt falls to the floor. She steps outside of it like that. And you're amazed that she's so comfortable doing this. But you've got to remember that inside even the most tense, rigid, scared woman, there's a big bosomed hooker dying to get out. <laughs> so she drops the skirt, she turns around, she lifts up the back of her blouse to show you those black, slippy knickers. You know, the ones that look like flash coke. Bum, bum, ba da 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 dum dum ba da da It's all yours, Daddy. <laughs> she turns around and she says, Come here. Come here to me. My lovely man. Mommy's big monkey. <laughs> and you're walking over. On the outside, you're like this. But on the inside, you're going, everybody was kung fu fighting. <laughs> Who's your daddy now? Who's your daddy now? <laughs> you walk over to her, she says, close your eyes. You close them and she kisses you in each eyelid, then she says, keep them closed. It's Christmas. And she kisses you the length and breadth of your body. You're bathed in pure heat. It's like being baptized again inside a human church. Just say the word and I shall be healed. <laughs> you compare those to those other nights when she comes home after spending an hour in the pub too long. <laughs> kitchen looking for something to drink. We hear you plowing up the stairs like something out of Jack and the Beanstalk. <laughs> Three, five, four, oh, fun. <laughs> you disappear into the bathroom. You reappear half an hour later. Half dressed, half undressed. One knocker fucked over your shoulder. <laughs> the other one hanging in front like a cycloptic tit. <laughs> Standing there in the silhouette of the door, thinking you're the queen of fucking Sheba. <laughs> We're lying in bed, what the fuck am I gonna do? You've got children, you pick up the youngest one, you put him in the middle, you go, the best of luck, buddy. <laughs> she strolls over, picks the child up by the scruff of the neck, fucks him out the door. Spins you over onto your back, you get an erection as a fright. <laughs> she clambers her way up on top of you. Next thing you're inside her, and she's grinding away. Hey, grinding away as if she's trying to rub you out. Rawr! Rawr! You come inside her and you think, what good can come from such a mucky embrace? <laughs> we do live on a blue ball in the middle of nowhere and nobody knows we're here, but we're still capable of miracles. You come inside, there's drunken ogre. <laughs> and nine months later, another little 
hero. Saint, <laughs> Saint Arrington, Richard Life. That's all from me, folks. Thank you very much, and good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>